Um, I remember giving the, a teaching on this particular text um, over 10 years ago. I was a single person. I was a single, I don't know if some of you were here for that, actually. Um, after Trish and I got married, uh, there was a man, uh, Jamal, some of you know, remember Jamal, Jamal uh, was, you know, married, had kids at that time, and he had heard that series. And so after I got married, he, he confesses to me, Jeff, I have to admit that when you as a single person were teaching on this text, I really struggled with your credibility. Um, I, I really didn't give it full full a full listen because you what do you know basically you know and um and now that i'm 10 years uh married um i do approach this text differently now um back when i was a single i would look at the scriptures and look for specific roles that a husband would have and specific roles that a wife would have specific duties so that whenever it is that I would get married, I'd have some sense of predictability about how this thing should work. Okay, that's how I approached it. And um, what I was really looking for was certainty. I was looking for, yeah, so the Bible is going to tell me who's going to wash the dishes, who's going to change the diapers, who's going to take out the garbage, uh, who's going to work, who's going to be the main breadwinner, so that I can walk into marriage with all of these you know roles and duties already lined up that's what i was kind of approaching the scriptures with and really what that was was a need for certainty when what i really needed to do was trust in god trust in god for how this is to work because the Bible really doesn't get into the details of who should wash the dishes and who should change the diapers. It really is very silent on those matters. It is far more sophisticated and nuanced. And I mean, it puts today's psychology to shame in a way because it is very, very insightful about um, the human condition and also what God designed marriage to be. Um, so when you approach when you approach this text, um, some we don't want to approach it trying to like figure everything out so that we can just be more predictable or more certain about what things should look like. Because um, as a single person, when I had that mentality, um, then the question would also be, how do you know she's the right one, right? How do you know? Like I, my sister, she got married when she was 23 years old and it was out of meeting Alvin uh, only three days prior that she said, yeah, I'll marry him. And I'm like, how do you know? How is it that you can make that decision? How do you know he's a godly guy? How do you know he's going to treat you the way the Bible tells you to? husbands to treat you how do you know after three days and and what I what was driving or fueling that question was I need certainty I need to know for sure that this guy's going to be this guy um, or for me it would be that this woman would be this kind of woman I need to know and really we can never know you know you really can't predict how your spouse is going to act and behave in ways that fit what you want you it just doesn't work that way so much of it is you walk in by faith by faith but there are things the bible does say about this these nuances in relationship that are very helpful for husbands and wives and we're going to explore that here today so there are three points that we're trying to mine in this text. At the first point, the three points, the first point from last time, marriage is a metaphor. Remember that? Marriage is a metaphor. It is, when the Bible talks about marriage, it's not just talking about you as a husband, you as a wife, and what that's supposed to look like. It is saying that marriage is a picture of something that transcends marriage. It is a picture of Christ and the church. When we can understand marriage as a metaphor that illustrates and depicts Jesus and his church, that's when we can understand our place in marriage. Um, 
our place in marriage is to reenact the character and personality of God in relation to his people. That's what marriage does. Marriage depicts Jesus's relationship to the church so that our marriages would bear witness to the love and goodness of Jesus with his church. So the question then, you know, begs the question, what do our marriages depict? Do our marriages depict that same forgiveness and grace and redemption that Jesus has with his church? Or does it depict bitterness, snippiness, anger, right? All those other things that marriage can also be. What is our marriage, my marriage, your marriage depicting? What it ought to be depicting is the relationship that Jesus has with his church. All right. So what's the witness of your marriage? Marriage is a metaphor. Number two, second point that we started last time, marriage is spirit empowered submission. Marriage is spirit empowered submission. You remember this? Okay. All right. Good. All right. I don't have to redo the wheel on this, right? Marriage is spirit empowered submission. And, and that whole phrase is important because we need the spirit to do this. Submission does not come naturally to human beings. Amen? Okay. All right. I'll take head nods. Yeah, head nods work. Yeah. Okay. It doesn't come naturally to us. We don't naturally say, I'm going to put aside my rights. I'm going to put aside my privileges. I'm going to put aside my agendas for the good of my spouse. We don't naturally say that, but that's what submission is. I'm putting aside my rights. I'm putting aside my privileges for the good of my spouse for the continued work of redemption in my spouse, for the work of redemption through my spouse. I'm going to submit. I'm going to support my spouse for their good. That's submission. That does not come naturally, right? But that is why we have the Spirit. The Spirit brings to us the submission of Jesus, the Spirit pours out the mind and the attitude and the perceptions of Jesus. And just picture Jesus submitting. How did Jesus submit? Philippians 2, Jesus submitted himself to becoming into the form of a servant and even submitted himself to death on a cross for our redemption. That's submission. So when we are thinking, how do I submit to my spouse I need to be thinking of Jesus. I need to be thinking of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane when he was about to go to the cross to redeem us and take the price of our sins. Before he did that in the garden, what did he pray? Father, not my will, but thine be done. He submitted himself to the Father's will for our redemption. So when we think, how do I submit to my spouse? I need to be thinking of Jesus. And when I think of Jesus, I need to surrender to the Spirit and say, Spirit, I can't do it on my own, but pour into me the submission of Jesus so that I can submit to my spouse and seek my spouse's good. That's what we need to do. It needs to be Spirit-empowered because we cannot do this on our own. And I hope this is a takeaway. This is a Christian view of marriage. If you don't have Christ in your life, you cannot do this. That's why when we apply this ethic into the world, it doesn't fly. It looks ridiculous because the world has no capacity for this. They don't have Jesus. They don't have the spirit of God. They haven't experienced his love. Therefore, this makes absolutely no sense. You have to be a Christian in order to fulfill this. Okay? Make sense? Agreed? Okay, let's talk about that. If you think you can pull this off without Jesus, I would love to, to, to have some coffee with you and tell me how, okay? Okay, because that just does not come naturally for us. We need the spirit of God. And thank you, God, for your spirit who gives us the spirit of Jesus. So when we, we're looking at this for both the husband and the wife, there's mutual submission. Verse 21 says that. Submit yourselves one to another out of reverence for Christ. Why do we submit? Out of reverence for Christ, out of honor for Christ. Jesus, I want to reenact 
in my marriage relationship what you did for me by submitting yourself to the Father and submitting yourself to the cross. I want to reenact that in my marriage. And that's how marriage becomes a metaphor. So that when people look at you, reenact the submission of Jesus, they go, what is that? What are you doing? Where do you get that from? And they say, and you have to say, I'm just doing what my Savior did. I'm just doing what my Savior did for me. This is my way of honoring him, which then answers the question, what if your husband's not a believer? Or what if your husband is kind of not fulfilling his part of this deal? The scripture says, wives, submit to your husbands. Even in 1 Peter 3, it says, even if your husband's an unbelieving husband, submit to your husband so that they may see the work of submission in G see Jesus lived out through you and somehow be won over somehow be won over by what they see in you what that husband sees in you so whether you're it, it doesn't matter whether your your husband earns it we didn't earn it did we we ever earned Jesus's submission Jesus's love for us no no, we just, he just did it for us out of love. And that's the same attitude. We do it because we want to honor the savior who submitted himself for us. Okay. So that's, that's where we, we looked at the wife and we said, what does this look like for the wife? It looks like the wife who comes alongside and underneath and supports the husband who is living out his purpose to make an impact in the world and out of making an impact in the world, she comes and provides relational strength, relational support. And she puts aside her own privileges and her own rights in order to support him in that endeavor. Okay. So we left it there with the wives and which wasn't really fair because most of this text has to do with the husbands. Do you notice that? We noticed that on Thursday. Look at the amount of verses dedicated to wives. Look at the amount of verses dedicated to husbands. Okay. And the reason for that, in Ephesians, in the time of the Ephesians, the culture was set up so that husbands basically ruled. They ruled everything, including their wives. Husbands ruled over their family. They ruled over their wives. There was incredible patriarchy. It was very authoritarian. And so the expectation was that wives would obey their husbands because they were just a little bit above property. Okay. So that's why Paul is devoting so much time to husbands because he's giving a radically different picture of what it means to be a husband. Husbands, you don't rule your wives. It never says that in scriptures. Husbands do not rule their wives. Right there, we have to we have to deal with some of our cultural deals, okay? If we come from very patriarchal cultures, we'll have to deal with that. We don't rule our wives. We don't, they don't obey us. We are to love our wives, love our wives, okay? So what does submission look like for the husbands? Simply this, husbands, you lead by love. You lead by love. Okay, verse 23. That was all introduction. <laughs> Here we go. All right. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the savior. The husband's the head. Now, what does this mean? We might look at that word head and go, oh, he's the authority. He's the ruler. And that's not really what this word means in this context. It means he's the leader. He's the leader. Now, even with that word leader, we might think that's authority, that's rule. But how does Jesus define leadership? That's the question we need to ask. How, because we are, we are depicting Jesus's leadership here, right? It's a, it's a metaphor. He's the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church. So how the husband is the head of the wife depends on how we understand how Christ is the head of the church. What does that mean? He's the leader of the church. He's the leader of the church. That's what it means. And, and how does he lead the church? It'll keep reading in that verse. He's the head of the church, his body, of which he is the savior. How does he lead? He lays down his life to save us. That's leadership, servant leadership. 
That's how he leads. He leads by love. So how does Jesus teach this? You can, we're going to look at a couple passages. Look at Matthew chapter 20. And we get this scene where James and John are coming to Jesus and they're saying, hey, Jesus, uh, when you come into your kingdom, we'd like to be on your right and your left. We'd like to rule with you. You know, I know the other disciples, you know, they're great guys and all, but we think we've earned this. So would you put us right here and our mom will vouch for us. You remember that scene, right? Um, kind of ridiculous. They want the highest seats of prestige when in Jesus's kingdom and Jesus calls them all together. Okay, guys, we are failing in servant leadership. All right, right now you got an F because here, here is servant leadership. In Matthew 20, 25, Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your what? Servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. How does Jesus lead? He lays down his life. He serves. He lays down his life. He serves. Again, in John chapter 13, this is the night before Jesus would be crucified. He's going to be arrested. And the filthy disciples are coming into the upper room. They're about to celebrate the Passover. None of them bother to clean their, themselves up. They've got filthy feet. You think about the feet, that what was on their feet during that time. I mean, there was all kinds of literally crap all over the streets. That was on their feet. They're bringing that into the upper room. No one's bothering to take the servant's position to wash each other's feet. What does Jesus do? Jesus comes in majestic humility takes off his outer tunic, gets water in a basin, starts washing the disciples' filthy feet. It's a sacred, I just imagine this sacred hush, you know, after Peter's like, no, no, you can't do it. And Jesus said, if you don't let me do this, then you won't have any part of me. And then Peter says, well, then just give me a bath. Wash me, wash me, wash me, wash me, right? And then after that, he just, he just washes all of their feet. It's this beautiful picture, beautiful picture of leadership, really. And then it says in John 13, verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet. You also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. How does Jesus lead? He serves. How does Jesus lead? He loves. That's how we ex exhibit leadership. Now, we live in a culture where if we look at movies and we, you know, die hard, die hard with a vengeance, die hard, right? The Bruce Willis, like, no, what, what is a real man? A real man is one who's got machine guns and he's mowing people down and, and he is victorious. He's dominating, he's controlling. He's, that's the macho man. Jesus turns that upside down and says, no, great men serve. Great men lay down their lives. Great men humble themselves for the sake of another. That's what they do. So three ways, three ways husbands do this. One, their love must be sacrificial, sacrificial. Verse 25, husbands, love your wife, wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, gave himself up for her. You know, it reminds me when I was a single guy and I was, you know, dating and trying to get a, a relationship to stick, you know, past you know, a month um, or so. And, and I would set up a nice date or two and, you know, there'd be, there'd be really nicely well curated, you know, got a nice restaurant. And then the plan would be to have a nice walk. Now, the nice walk hopefully would allow me to, to experience her reaching out to hold my hand. That was the goal. If I can get her to hold my hand, then I would be like, okay, 
All right, we got something here. She wants to hold my hand. That means something to me. Okay. You know, and then, you know, when, when she reaches out and she holds your hand for the first time, you get that, you know, get all the feels going. It's like, oh, this is good. This is good, right? So then three months of that, you're holding hands. You start asking yourself, now what? <laughs> she, she's holding my hand. Okay, we're holding hands. We've, we've been holding hands now for, you know, a couple months. Then what? What happens in a lot of relationships is a lot of these relationships start like this, and then they just hope to continue the feels. They want the romance. They want the, oh, that happy, you know, tingly feeling to last. And so they get married and they hope that marriage is somehow going to up the ante on their good feelings. And what happens? It doesn't last. It doesn't last. Why? Because it's not real love. You get the tingly feelings, you get the romance, but is that real love? That's not real love. It's a pathway there. You know, nothing wrong with holding hands and all that, but it's not love until someone like me says, hey, I need to stop thinking about what I'm getting out of this relationship. And I need to start thinking about what I can give to this relationship. What can I give? And that's where we start seeing sacrifice. In a dating relationship, single people, if you're in a dating relationship and you are in this place where all you're doing is holding hands and that's all it's doing, then you're probably done at that point, right? Because unless he is starting to give of himself for your sake, where he's sacrificing time, he's sacrificing emotional investment, he's putting aside his own agenda for your sake, when you can start seeing that, that's when you've got real love. Good sign. Good sign, right? We're good. Okay. But in our culture, the, the expectation in our culture is that marriage is just supposed to be promoting my happiness, promoting my self-fulfillment. I need to be happy. And if I'm no longer happy, I'm out. Hence, 50% of marriages end up in divorce. Why? Because the assumption is this is supposed to make me happy when really what's supposed to happen is you have to have, you have to have two people who are giving to each other and the husband needs to lead in that. The husband needs to sacrificially love. Now I'm not saying that the, the wife doesn't sacrificially love, right? Um, we're not saying that does, is the wife supposed to love her husband? Yes, but the husband's supposed to lead in that. There's supposed to be mutual love, yes, but the husband needs to take the lead and set the tone for that in sacrificial love. I love the story of, of an example of the sacrificial love. Robertson McQuilkin, you may have known who that is. He was the president of Columbia Bible College and Seminary, and his wife, Muriel, developed Alzheimer's disease and was eventually terrified to be without him, be without Robert. Some of his friends advised him to just put her into an institution and allow him to have the freedom to continue to be president in, in, of the institutions. He chose instead to leave Columbia um, eight years short of retirement in order to care for her. So he stepped down from the whole thing, stepped down from Columbia in 1990 to care full time for his ailing wife until she died. That's sacrificial love. And when he was asked about it, what led you to do? He said, you know, that it wasn't anything heroic. It was actually quite natural because after all of these years of marriage, this is just the pattern of our life. We just always sacrifice for each other. Now is just my turn. That's how we saw it. Okay. That's, I love that picture. That's what husbands do. Husbands sacrifice for the sake of their wife. So sacrificial love. Two, visionary love, visionary love. Verse 26, you love her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. This means, husbands, you are to peer into the soul of your wife and see the holy work that God is doing to make her more like Jesus, okay? 
You're to see that glory that's in your wife and see the potential that God has put in her and you are to aim and, and feed and equip and support and love her into that good picture. That means you need to be aware. What are the leading edges of what God is doing in my wife that is making her more like Jesus? What are the leading edges? Is he helping her to trust more? Is he helping her to love more, to receive love more, to forgive more, to let go of anger? What is the spirit of God doing in my wife that is creating that beautiful picture of a holy wife, a godly wife that God is working on? I need to be part of that. And, and I love, um, you know, the only kind of glimpses, we get glimpses of this. It's kind of like, you remember summertime in San Francisco? That was a glimpse, right? We had, we had like two weeks, right? It's like, oh yes, the sun, it's warm. And then it was fall, like two weeks and then we're done. That's what it's like. We, we catch these glimpses in our wife. I've told this story a lot, but you know, I, I, it's still my reference point when we were on our honeymoon in Kauai and I'm, I'm standing, I'm walking with, with Trish and she, the sun is setting and she's in front of me and the sun is setting. And, and as she's in front of me, I see her silhouette and the sun shining over her. And I catch this glimpse of something glorious in Trish, like everything that I had known up to that point about her it just kind of went another 10 years. Like I could see, oh, this is where it's going. And I took a picture. I literally took a picture. I took a picture of this and I showed Trish, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm seeing in you. You don't see yourself this way right now, but I'm seeing this in you and this is where we're going. Okay. All right. And, and this is what marriage has been like. Marriage is like, you know what you're living, you're operating out of the sense of identity that you think you are right now, based on what your parents saw in you, what your friends have seen in you and all that. I'm telling you, I see something beautiful that is way down the road, but we're going there. That's where we're going. Okay. And, and because we get these glimpses. If we look for what God is doing in our spouse, we get these glimpses and we hold on to those glimpses and say, oh yeah, I may look at my wife right now and she's a mess in a lot of ways, but I can't say, oh, this is how she's always going to be. Right. Right. It, it, like I've said before, like if, if you struggle with patience, you just cannot say, you know, your, your spouse cannot say of you, oh yeah, my spouse, you, you really is impatient. The truth is my spouse is just not patient yet. That's what we, we don't give definitions and fixed characterizations because nothing is fixed. Nothing is set. We are all being shaped and created and molded into the likeness of Jesus. And so as, as creatives, right? When a creative sits down with a piece of pottery, they don't just look at the piece of clay and go, oh my goodness, what am I going to do with this? They have a vision of what they want to create. And it's that vision that inspires them to shape and mold that piece of clay. It's that vision. This is the same with us. We are means of God's grace into our spouse's life so that the potter can continue to shape the clay through our hands. Wow. Okay. I don't know about you, but that in a way that's thrilling, it, in a way it's terrifying, <laughs> right? What a great responsibility, but it's not me. It's not me. It's the, it's the potter using me as his hands. What power that has, right? That's incredible power. When, when a wife is giving her husband the power to shape the way that she sees herself, that's incredible power. And it requires great vulnerability on the part of the wife. But we said this last time, part of a wife submitting to her husband is receiving her husband's love and care for her. That's part of what it means to submit to her husband. And so a wife is coming in saying, okay, I feel vulnerable. I feel naked here, but I'm giving you this incredible power to shape who I am. Okay, 
I trust you, I trust you. And we go into this thing with fear and trembling, but the more vulnerable we are with each other, the more we trust each other, the more we can start to move into that beautiful glimpse of holiness. Okay, now singles, the more that you develop friendships in which people can edify you, build you up, make you more like Jesus, you can be in friendships like this. If you're in a dating relationship like this, good sign, good sign, because now you're beyond the feels. You're way beyond the feels. You're moving into actual life, actual growth, the actual work of God. One of the things that I love about um, <laughs> Trish, this does not matter to Trish at all, but one of the things I noticed is that when, when Trish um, moved up here to San Francisco, you know, LA is kind of like, gritzy you know um you you can be in certain places and you just smell chanel number five just kind of wafting into the air you know it's like people are dressed up people are you know putting on a good face that seems to that seems to matter more down there i don't know it just seems that way which is i, I don't want to i don't want to bad mouth socal although it's so easy but i don't want to i don't want to do it but Here's the thing, when, when Trish came up here, um, I noticed she didn't wear as much makeup. And in my heart, I never, I've, I never told her this, but I, oh no, I did tell her, I, I told her this. And, I, and in my heart, I was like, oh, this is good. Why? Because I'm not, I'm not dealing with the Trisha who's trying to impress me or impress anybody. I'm dealing with the real Trisha now. This is, this is who she is. She feels safe. She feels loved enough that she can just be herself. That's where, that's where you want a relationship to go. You want a relationship to get beyond all the fields because what are you doing in all the fields? You're trying to impress each other, right? You're marketing, basically, yourself to each other. Once you can stop marketing and you stop like trying to like sell this ideal self of yourself and you can just be yourself, that's when you can work with somebody and see the glory, see the beauty, see the Christ-likeness in that person. So when you stop trying to impress and you're just yourself in the safety of each other's love, that's when you can actually see the beauty of, that, what, of what God is doing in that person's life, in your spouse's life, okay? And, and, and again, single people, you can get to that point. You can get to that point where you can really feel safe and accepted um, with one another. That's a beautiful thing um, when you can experience that in friendship. The third part of this love, the third part, this love is sacrificial. This love is visionary. This love is nurturing, nurturing. Verse 28, in the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. What Paul is saying is, husbands, you ought to treat your wife the way you treat yourself, right? When you get up in the morning and you, you don't have to think for a moment, whose teeth should I be brushing this morning? You don't ever think about that, right? You just, you just do it. It's your teeth. You don't think about it. You go and brush your teeth, right? In the same way, we are to have that kind of care for our wife so that when we see our wife and we see her soul, we see her faith, we want to nourish her soul, nourish her faith as if it were our own soul and our own faith. It's got to be that kind of default, that kind of intuitive place where I can look at my wife and say, oh, if she's hurting, I'm hurting. If she needs help, then I'm going to help her as if I would help myself. It's got, it's, there's a unity there. There's a unity between you and your wife that says, whoa, I'm going to care for her like I'm going to care for me, right? The way I think about brushing my teeth, right? I need to have that kind of instinct when it comes to how I love my wife and care for my wife. So I'm going to have far more compassion. I'm going to have far more grace. I'm going to be far more understanding, right? Because when we look at... <laughs> It is so much easier to go after the faults of other people. We're far more compassionate to ourselves, aren't we? It's like, yeah, I mean, everyone's got their problems, but, you know, 
I'm just like everybody else. You know, we, we make these kinds of excuses. We justify ourselves. We're, we're far more compassionate at times with ourselves. That's what we ought to be with our spouse. And husbands, that's how we lead. We lead with that. We set the tone that way. We are compassionate and gracious and nurturing. That's where um, we can truly nourish our wife's soul, nourish our wife's faith as if it were our own, okay? So this is, this is what a husband is to do. And this is, this is what submission looks like for the husband. Again, it is the husband who is submitting. There's mutual submission happening. For the wife, it looks like I'm going to come underneath and support my husband relationally and with relational strength and wisdom because my, my husband is out there making an impact on the world, but he needs help. He needs support. He doesn't have the relational skills at times that he needs from me. So I'm going to support him in that way. That's the wife's submission. The husband's submission, lead with love, sacrificial, visionary, nurturing love. What happens when you have two people who are mutually submitting to each other in this way? That's for next time. That's the picture though. You get this beautiful picture of what Jesus and his church are like. That's the picture that we are to give to the world. So again, we cannot fulfill this on our own. You need to know Jesus. You need, and I don't mean just know Jesus, know what he did for you. You need to have experienced that when Jesus was in the garden of Gethsemane and he is praying, father, not my will, but yours be done. He's looking at you. He's got you in his mind. You are right there in the garden. He's looking at you and he's talking to the father and he's saying, father, if there's any way that Jeff can be redeemed, then let's do it. But if this is the only way, if it is for me to go to the cross in order to redeem him from his sin, then I'm going to do it. You've got to experience that. You've got, it's got to be personal for you. And that's the question. Is it so personal for you that submission is not something you have to just muster up because it's just willpower, but submission is something you have access to because his spirit is bringing Jesus's submission into your heart, into your mind, in how you're thinking and how you're acting. You need to have that personal experience with Jesus in order to live this out. There's no other way. There's no other way. How can you get this into your heart? It is only through the spirit of God. It is through surrender, surrender, yieldedness to the spirit where you really realize you can't do this on your own. I cannot naturally submit. I can't do it. Whether I'm a wife or a husband, I can't do it on my own. And it's at that base instinct of helplessness that we cry out to the spirit, spirit, help me. Spirit, give me your spirit of submission. Have you done that? Have you done that? Or do you find yourself hitting a wall? Oh, I don't know if I can submit. I don't know. If that's where you're at, it's like if it's grating at you, then this is a time just to surrender, just to say, Lord, I can't. I can't. Spirit, I can't, but you can. We do a breath prayer. And I want to invite you into this breath prayer right now. And that breath prayer basically is this. Spirit, I can't. And then you can. So the way this works, if you haven't done a breath prayer, is like this. We say the word, spirit, I can't. And we take a big breath. We hold that breath for three seconds. And then we exhale. And after we exhale, we say, you can. Okay, got it? Let's do that together, all right? First words are spirit, I can't. And then the last words are you can, all right? Ready, go. Spirit, I can't. Breathe in, hold, breathe out, you can. Let's do that two more times, ready, go. Spirit, I can't, breathe in, hold, Breathe out. You can.
One more time. Ready? Go. Spirit, I can't. Breathe in. Hold. Breathe out. You can. You can. Lord, as we breathe in, we, we breathe you into all the areas of our hearts and our desires and our mind. Come and pour out the life of Jesus, the mind of Jesus, the love of Jesus, the submission of Jesus into our very being so that we can submit lovingly to one another and especially to our spouse through your spirit. We need you. We're helpless without you, but we can do it with you. For the glory of your name, Lord, so that others may see you lived out in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.